Today at the National Press Club, the Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security, Claire O'Neill. She first entered Parliament in 2013 and has served on Labor's front bench since 2016. Claire O'Neill with today's National Press Club address from Canberra. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra and today's Westpac Address. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle. Australians have, have been confronted with the sickening reality of a mass plundering of personal details in a series of cyber attacks on major Australian companies of late. It's just one of the many new forms of challenges to our sense of personal and national security that have emerged in recent years, even as the threat of terrorism, which dominated much of the first two decades of the century, has eased. Our speaker today has been put in charge of the mega department established a few years ago to embrace all these security issues and much more besides. We look forward to hearing from Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill on her agenda. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. We face a time of great global challenge. Before us lie many risks and many choices. As Australians, we carry into that challenge the most precious of gifts. Our nation is entwined with the wisdom and resilience of 60,000 years of Indigenous culture. I honour the enduring custodianship of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. I acknowledge the Indigenous Australians who are here with us today. I acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues who have joined us and I want to note that we have a large number of national security leaders here with us in this room and I want to say on behalf of government and on behalf of the Australian people how truly grateful we are for your national service. Thank you. <clears throat> Two years ago, I spoke at the National Press Club for the first time. I spoke about how crisis and challenge have been pivotal to Australia's national story. When the chips are down, Australians are willing, in a way that is quite unusual around the world, to throw off old ideas about society and government and make big, gutsy choices about our future. From the depression of the 1890s came our federation, built on a national commitment to equality and delivered through the AIDS pension and the harvester judgment. From the existential shock of the Second World War emerged our proud multicultural Australia and a new place for our country and the world. The long malaise of the 1970s gave birth to a reform agenda that led to the longest period of continuous economic growth of any country anywhere in the world. In each case, a period of extraordinary challenge for our country, which led to radical, uniquely Australian solutions to the problems we confronted. And each time we did it together, as one country with humility, humour, ambition, bravery and resolve. When I last spoke at the press club, I was an opposition junior frontbencher with a lot of ideas, but perhaps not a lot of power to do much about them. Today, I speak from a different perspective, deeply honoured to be a part of a new government that can, will and must change how our country thinks about its future. So today I want to do two, uh, three things. I want to speak about the generational challenge that faces our country. I want to talk about what that challenge means for home affairs and I want to describe how our government is reimagining the work of my department to help Australia take it on. The Department of Home Affairs was recreated in 2017 to protect the domestic security of our country. It's only five years ago, but there would be few five-year periods in history in which Australia's national security picture has changed so much. It is overwhelming to list all that's happened in that period. A one in 100 year pandemic, bushfires which burned millions of acres of land and left our capital cities covered in choking smoke. 
cyber attacks which saw the personal information of literally millions of Australians stolen from them. Three big shifts stand out as most important. When Home Affairs was first created, the discussion about climate change and national security was largely academic and indeed it was derided by the former government. Just five years on, climate change is a recognised growing part of Australia's national security picture. Climate change is creating massive movements of people that may become unmanageable. Already, national disaster, natural disasters are forcing about 21.5 million people each year from, our home, from their homes. In our region, this, alongside foreseeable food and energy shortages, will be big vulnerabilities that we are going to need to work with our neighbours to address. Climate change is creating natural disasters at rolling frequency. For affected Australians, these disasters can be life-shattering. And from a security perspective, their management is a hugely consuming task for government and the community. And this in itself is a national security risk. What I am most worried about here is what will happen in the event of cascading disasters. Imagine a future January where we see a Black Saturday sized bushfire in the southeast, a major flood in the north of our country, and then overlay a cyber attack on a major hospital system on the west coast. Our government would be fully absorbed in the management of that crisis. And then consider how capable we would be of responding to and engaging with a security issue in our region. In the 40 odd years since I was born, we've looked out into a region where there has been almost a sense of inevitability about increasing wealth and democratisation and that is clearly changing. China is a hugely powerful influence over our friends and neighbours. And over this last five years, we have learned a lot about how this big and powerful country will exert its will in the years to come. And even beyond our region, the global world order is shifting and creaking. Big state politics is back, and there is clear coordinated competition between authoritarian countries and democracies. Now, these are big shifts in our global environment. And of course, the Australian government's approach will be led by the Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. They are important to my work because they also have significant domestic security implications. And that is in part because of technology. During past periods of intense global competition, the security of Australians wasn't really affected until we actively joined a conflict. But today, new tools of statecraft are bringing what would otherwise be global security challenges into the everyday lives and homes of our citizens. It's felt in our economy, where we're waking from a cyber slumber. It's felt in our private lives, where our identities are under threat and personal information is at risk. It's felt in business and research, where Australia's hard-won innovations are at constant risk of theft. And it's felt in our democracy, where foreign actors are trying to influence decisions in our parliaments and universities, and subjecting Australians to online misinformation and disinformation campaigns, which spread like viruses around our communities. So when you put all of this together, it's simple, but it's stark. Our government's view is that Australia faces the most dangerous set of strategic circumstances since the Second World War. And those circumstances are having real impacts on Australians, even when they are at home. So what does this mean for home affairs? Peter Dutton was the first minister for home affairs in the department's current incarnation. Indeed, he was its chief architect. He spoke at the press club in 2018 shortly after he'd taken on the job. And his speech is a genuinely fascinating description of his vision for the department. He talked about boats and borders. He talked about terrorism and child exploitation. He talked about bikies, organised crime, illicit drugs and deportations, all very important issues. It included, naturally, a Dutton-esque sprinkling of light moral panic. But if you strip out all of the politics, he describes his department doing incredibly important things, 
but it's an oddly narrow view of home affairs. And it's one designed to tackle a fundamentally different national security environment than the one that I've described to you today. To protect the domestic security of our nation, home affairs must continue its important work as set out in 2017. But it must also do some of its old work in new ways, and it must do some new work entirely. In the category of old work in new ways, there's no better place to start than cybersecurity. In September and October this year, Australia experienced its two worst ever cyber attacks in our history within three weeks of each other. Two months ago, the National Australia Bank told Australians that they are subject to 50 million attempted cyber attacks a month. The Australian Taxation Office, 3 million a month. This threat is huge, it is relentless, and it is only getting bigger. Cybersecurity is suddenly a hot topic in the boardroom and at the kitchen table. Our government has commitment and resolve to fix this, but it is going to take time. Better cybersecurity for Australia means all businesses and citizens changing how they engage with the internet. We need to prepare for more cyber attacks over the coming years as we undertake this, undertake this incredibly important work. And the truth is that in cyber security, we are unnecessarily vulnerable. We did not do the work nationally over the last decade to help us prepare for this national challenge. Prime Minister Morrison's decision to abolish the cyber security ministry when he came to office was an absolute <coughs> shocker. So let me say briefly what we have done since the Albanese government was elected. For the first time, Australia will punch back at the hackers through a collaboration between the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Signals Directorate. This will be a 100-person team permanently focused on hunting down people who would seek to do us harm and hacking back. It will take some time to get this singing, but when it does, it will change the game for cybersecurity in our country. We've made some big changes to how the Australian government responds to cyber incidents. We've legislated a proper penalties regime under privacy law, and we've taken leadership of a new global disruption effort under the, th under the 36 country counter ransomware initiative. I am a big believer in good analysis after a crisis. Our government has asked one of Australia's foremost cybersecurity and telco experts, Rachel Falk, to look at what home affairs could learn from the Optus and Medibank incidents. And in the coming months, we will translate this enormous power of work that she has done into public policy reform. Optus and Medibank were terrible events. I felt them very deeply. In fact, my family was caught up in both. It's now my job to turn this set of unbelievable disasters into a permanent step change in cybersecurity for our country. I want Australia to be the most cyber secure country in the world by 2030. And I believe that's possible. But we need a reset and we need a pathway to get there. That's why today I am announcing a major program of work to develop a new cybersecurity strategy for Australia. The cybersecurity strategy will help Australia bring the whole nation into the fight to protect our citizens and to protect our economy. It will help us strengthen critical infrastructure and government networks. It will help us build sovereign capabilities in cybersecurity because this is something Australia must be able to do for itself. And it will help us strengthen our international engagement so Australia can play a leadership role on the global stage and work in partnership with our Pacific neighbours to lift cybersecurity across our region. This project is going to be led by three experts. Andy Penn, who lucky for us has just rolled off as CEO of Telstra, and he's agreed to devote his incredible intellect and energy to this national effort. Rachel Falk, who I mentioned earlier, one of Australia's preeminent cybersecurity experts who has helped us with Optus and Medibank, will also join this team and Mel Hutfeld, the former Chief of Air Force, will lend his hugely significant national security experience to this project. In addition to this amazing group of Australians, 
Some of the biggest cyber guns from around the world love the scale of, amb of our ambition and they've agreed to help. Former UK Cybersecurity Centre CEO and eminent Oxford University professor Kieran Martin will lead a global cyber expert panel who will ensure that our work really is world leading. Across government, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher will work with me on the government facing aspects of the strategy and Assistant Minister Tim Watts will lead our international focus. We've got the, the burning platform, we've got the mandate for change, we've genuinely now got the best minds on the problem and now it's time to translate that into a more cyber secure Australia. Let me turn now to foreign interference. Each year, ASIO provides an annual assessment of our national threats. In this year's assessment, ASIO Director General Mike Burgess told Australia that for the first time, espionage and foreign interference have replaced terrorism as the most significant domestic security issue we face. An enormous thing to happen in our security environment. Espionage and foreign interference threaten the things we value most about our country our social cohesion, our trusted democracy, freedom of thought in our academic sector. This is a fight that really, really matters. We need an ambition and a scale of response here that matches the size of the problem. We've got to strip the politics out of this conversation. This problem is not limited to the actions of one or two countries. Under the former government, the way politicians talked about foreign interference was over-politicised and frankly a bit xenophobic. And any security expert will tell you that that approach is deeply counterproductive for our national security. ASIO Director General Burgess has said repeatedly, our best asset in the fight against foreign interference, interference are the Australian people. And within that, our loved and loyal diaspora communities. My experience in dealing with this problem so far is that for most people who would be targets of foreign interference or be in its orbit, think about politicians, academics, community leaders, they desperately want to fight this problem. And part of the next phase of our policy response will be to start to open up a bit and focus on arming the people who need to understand this problem with usable information. So we'll do that through a program of direct engagement with possible targets of foreign interference to help them understand what foreign interference looks like. How does it present? What does the playbook look like? So we can help them understand what they can do to protect themselves so they can help us protect our country. Immigration is the third area of existing work where a big evolution for home affairs is required. The global challenges that we face are enormous. Why wouldn't we invite the best and brightest people from around the world to come and help us tackle them? Yet today, our immigration system doesn't allow for anything of the sort. It's complex, it's bureaucratic, it lacks strategy, it's expensive and glacially slow. It's not serving the needs of our country, of business or of migrants. Under the former government, the debate centred so much, almost exclusively, on how we keep people out rather than what we do to get people here who we need here. We are in a fierce competition for global talent, but our competitors are well into the marathon while we are noodling around at the starting blocks. When we came to government, there were almost a million unprocessed visas just sitting there in the system in the middle of the biggest labour shortage we have experienced since the Second World War. To me, that was emblematic of the lack of interest by former ministers in this so foundational a task of the Australian government. Due to sheer inertia, the system had defaulted into bringing in very high numbers of temporary, lower skilled workers who churned through the labour market. And as a result, Australia today has a problem we have always studiously avoided, and that is a large underclass of undocumented migrant workers who are living in our country today and extremely vulnerable to exploitation. That is not what a world-class migration system looks like. And it's completely out of step with Australia's hugely successful historical focus on migration based on permanency, on citizenship 
and on fair rights for workers no matter where they come from. Determining who should be invited to join us in our national endeavours is one of the most important things that the Australian Government does. And we're going to take a run at fixing it through a big piece of work being led by former Secretary of the Treasury and Prime Minister and Cabinet, Martin Parkinson, ACPSM. I've talked about cybersecurity, countering foreign interference and immigration as three areas of work where the department needs to evolve to help us confront the challenges ahead. And I now want to speak about three additional areas of new work that I am working with the department to undertake. And the first is relation to, in relation to climate change. Our government, under the leadership of Minister Murray Watt, will be the first in Australian history to run disaster management as a centralised, well-coordinated, enduring function of the Australian government. It is time for us all to stop feigning shock at supposedly once in a generation floods and fires and st storms. The world has witnessed a tenfold increase in the number of natural disasters since the 1960s, and this is going to get worse as the world warms further. We need disaster management to be a routine, seamless, well-practiced function of Australian government so that when multiple disasters strike, government and the community are not completely consumed by them. Australia is the developed country in the world most at risk from the warming climate. And in national security, the former government's unwillingness to acknowledge this reality of climate change was foolish, dogmatic and reckless. Peter Dutton approached Home Affairs with a posture that was reactive to the issues and reactionary in the politics. It didn't make us any safer, and I would like to change it. We know a lot about the national security environment we are heading into. There are some events ahead that are quite easily foreseeable. Yet the Australian government has not seriously considered what those events will mean for us on the home front. As we enter a period of increased competition in our region, will Australia be able to get what it needs from the world? Are we too reliant on some countries for things that we cannot survive without? And what should we do about those things? As the national security implications of climate change become better understood, what do we need to do to prepare beyond institutionalising disaster management? So today I'm announcing two new pieces of work to deal with these questions that will be undertaken by Home Affairs. The first will focus on national resilience and the output will be a clear cross-cutting, uh, a cross-government picture of the home front implications of the climate and security environment we face and it will provide recommendations for government about the steps we need to take to ensure that Australians continue to live their beautiful life of security and prosperity while the incredible global complex issues we face are played out around the globe. The National Resilience Task Force will work to explore how Australia can be better placed to deal with shocks and crises. And this will include looking at whether we have the right legislative frameworks and authorities to manage national challenges that we are likely to confront. It will look at how we're anticipating future shocks and give advice to government about what we can do to make sure that we can bounce back quickly, especially when we are confronted with multiple concurrent events. The second piece of work is a significant, um, a significant look at the resilience of Australia's democracy. So let me just quickly explain why this is a national security issue. In our quest to keep Australians safe in the coming decades, our democracy will be our biggest national asset and we need to protect our national assets. And because competitor countries are seeking to undermine our democracy and we need to fight back. Their intention is to justify authoritarianism by making it look like democracies are inherently dysfunctional and to weaken countries like ours and constrain us from responding to global events that our adversaries may create. The task force will consider the enormous volume of work that has been done on this question in Australia already, including insights and expertise of Australia's civil service. It will include, for example, the work completed by the Democracy 2025 partnership between Professor Mark Evans and the Museum of Australian Democracy. 
The Group of Seven and the OECD have done a lot of work on the question of resilient democracies. Uh, there is a very large volume of academic research into social capital and trust between and among citizens and government. We know that foreign interference, misinformation and disinformation are on the rise and we need to reduce our susceptibility to those efforts and that will include thinking about a new generation of initiatives in civics and social cohesion. And we need to explore what we can do with tech companies to reduce the spread of polarisation and falsehoods which become such an, uh, such an important part of our lives. Australians can get pretty down on our democracy there are good reasons for that, and indeed, a bit of Australian scepticism in the world of politics is a very, very healthy thing. But politicians like me need to tell a better story about Australia's world-leading democratic history. We are the sixth oldest democracy in the world. We are the great democratic innovator, the inventor of the secret ballot, one of the first countries in the world to give women the right to vote. We have very high participation in our democracy and a strong and independent electoral commission. And politicians do their part and respect the result. We have a brilliant independent media, which despite its many challenges, does a bloody good job. We have a hell of a lot to be proud of here. Labor's first female parliamentarian, Dorothy Tagney, said in her first speech to the Senate in September 1943, when Australia was, of course, at war, we shall make this country what it should be, a model for all other democracies to follow. One of the most powerful things Australia can do for the world is prove that democracy works. We cannot allow the global debate to settle into the lazy thinking of false equivalencies, where somehow all political systems are morally equal. They are not. People should choose their leaders. To me, to us, that is a truism. But democracy is not just a political system. It is a mindset about community, pluralism, tolerance, rationality, choice and freedom. And yet, trust in democracy is in substantial decline in Australia and around the world. And pop populism and polarisation are on the rise. And we cannot stand by and do nothing. I have had many discussions with global democracy experts over the last six months. This is a much admired problem. Many can explain the shapes and contours. No one seems to know what to do. And in this, I want Australia to lead the way. What can we do concretely about the problems our democracy faces so Australia can be the light on the hill? This will be the work of the Strengthening Democracy Task Force in the Home Affairs Department. So let me quickly summarise. To prepare Australia for what is to come, our government is reshaping the work of Home Affairs. We will continue our strong focus on critical national security issues such as terrorism. We will evolve how we work in some key areas. I have mentioned cyber security, foreign interference and immigration. And we need to engage in some new areas of work, disaster management, national resilience, and the strength of our democracy. Let me finish by saying something brief about the tenor of our national security conversation. And I want to ask everyone here to consider what assumptions they may have about what strength in national security looks like. Are the people who keep us safe those with the harshest words and the biggest, scariest rhetoric. If that were the case, we would be brilliantly positioned for the national security challenges we face after nine years of Peter Dutton in key national security roles. And we're not. In this crucial national security discussion, we should never conflate chest beating with strength. We should never confuse fighting words with resolve and the commitment and ability to deliver. Part of the problem with the old, broken conversation of the last decade was the endless, rampant politicisation of every area of Australian public policy. It was not just a wasted decade on energy policy or economic reform. It was a decade where we could have done so much more to help our country be safe. 
and yet in national security what I saw was so much public policy being designed not to make our country safer but to bludgeon or wedge labour. Our government is taking a different approach. The PM has made it absolutely clear to his cabinet. The threats that we face are serious and urgent and our response cannot and will not be driven by politics. We need determined, clear-eyed analysis and steely, calm, methodical delivery. Scalpels, not sledgehammers. And that's what we're getting from the PM, the DPM and the Foreign Minister. In defence, Richard Miles is a person of depth and vision. With his single-minded determination to make our country safer, faster, he is putting us on a path to revolutionising our ability to defend ourselves. I'm so grateful for the work he is doing as a colleague but also as an Australian. And in foreign affairs, just look at the mess that was left for, for Penny Wong. Our global reputation in real trouble, the leader of one of our closest allies driven to call our then Prime Minister a liar, our failure to recognise the climate crisis which created enormous tensions with our Pacific neighbours. For goodness sake, they couldn't even get along with New Zealand. Australia's reputation and role in the world have been comprehensively reshaped by Penny Wong in just six months. Every Australian should sleep safer at night knowing that these serious people have charge of these crucial areas of public policy. Now there are many in the opposition who are good, thoughtful people and I think they know that the approach we are taking, strong, serious, depoliticised, is how we make our country safer, not by beating our chests and playing the politics of the moment. A better standard of debate than what we saw over the last nine years would be a good and important thing for the country. We're showing up for it and I hope they do too. My friend Annika Wells reminds us that our goal in politics should be to be a good ancestor. The issues that will define the lives of my children and grandchildren are not bikies and boat people. They are how Australia's governments manage climate change, how they navigate our interests with regard to China, and how they protect Australians in the face of the biggest shift in the global world order since the Second World War. Two ideas are foundational to my approach to politics. When Australia needs to change, we cannot afford to look back. Our goal is transformation, not restoration. And I am profoundly optimistic every day for my country. No country is better positioned for a safe and prosperous future than Australia. We have huge power to shape the world around us, but we have to be smart and agile about how we prepare our country for what lies ahead, and in particular, how we play things over the coming decade. And if I can play a meaningful role in that, it will be the most important work that I do in my lifetime. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. And if you could just indulge us for one moment. Um, we just wanted to announce and give our congratulations to John Ross of the Times Higher Education, the, the Times Higher Education Asia Pacific editor, who has won the University's Australia Higher Education Journalist of the Year Award today. Um, and uh, he wasn't here when we announced it, so congratulations to John, who is now here. <laughs> Uh, if I could just uh, take you to the points about uh, the home front implications of climate change um, and re building resilience, can you explain to us a little bit, I mean, as you say, th th there's institutionalising disaster management, but, but those bigger questions about supply chains and things, how far can you see those reaching? Would it involve going as far as actually establishing industries under uh, sort of the direction of government, if you like, uh, to address supply chain vulnerabilities. What's, what's, the, what's the scope of those sorts of issues? 
Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, if I can just say briefly, you know, we should, as a nation, be already able to answer these questions easily. And the fact that we can't, I think, does demonstrate that um, we're behind where we need to be because of the reckless unwillingness of the former government to accept the realities of climate change and what it is inevitably going to mean for our country. So in terms of the work that the department will do, um, the institutionalising of disaster management will be very important. Um, one of the things that we need to be aware of is just um, consuming distraction that will be created by rolling national disa natural disasters and that will be a part of our future and we need to uh, work out how government can basically walk and chew gum at the same time. How can we manage what may be you know, a handful of natural disasters occurring in our country and at the same time manage security issues that could arise at that same time. And then you raise a broader point, Laura, about um, what the kind of bigger picture implications of this are. So Home Affairs is going to look at these questions. What will um, a radically changed climate mean for us in a decade and in 20 years? And how are we going to start to prepare what we will need to be able to do for ourselves in some instances? Um, to cope with those changes. Ben Peckham has a question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, uh, just on the issue of community cohesion, the Indian government has, um, uh, has raised concerns with you and um, Foreign Minister Wong about the rise of Sikh separatism in Australia and its links to um, uh, proscribed terrorist groups in India. Mm -hmm. um, it's alleged that a um, number of individuals have come into the country uh, seeking to um, foment um, division in the Indian community, particularly in uh, Victoria. Um, what's the Albanese government's assessment of the threat posed by the Khalistan movement? Um, is there a national security response to this situation? Um, and uh, will the Australian government consider proscribing uh, the Khalistan, pro-Khalistan groups as terrorist organisations? Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so. Firstly, can I say I represent a very multicultural community, uh, beautiful place in South East Melbourne. And one of the things that's so extraordinary about that part of Australia is that we often have um, diaspora communities who come from different sides of a conflict in their home country. And they come to Australia and they, um, they, they become Australian and those conflicts dissipate and fall away. And we have one of the most socially cohesive multicultural countries in the world and we should be very, very proud of that. And that is the prism through which I see most of these issues. Um, I'm not going to comment on the um, specifics of the reporting that you've done, Ben, and I think those have been, you know, very good news stories. Uh, I don't think it's helpful for me to use a national stage to pick out one community group and make comments about them. But if I could just say, um, you know, we've got a number of people in this room who have been involved in our counter-terror efforts over a long period of time, their work has been extraordinary. The extent to which they have foiled plots and kept us safe is um, an enormous national service and I've got a lot of confidence in the maturity of those arrangements to manage conflicts and situations that would arise. Sorry, I, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly so follow like, that this up. Is, yeah, this is like um, question time for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> taking your point of order. I mean, yeah. are they, uh, is the government looking closely at this situation yeah. In, a, in a national security Yeah. So ag again, Ben, thank you for the question, but I'm not going to get into detail about, um, you know, subgroups of communities on a national stage. It's just not helpful for politicians to wade into these conversations. We've got really good institutional arrangements to manage these issues, and I've got confidence in those arrangements. Thank you. So all the other questioners don't get any ideas from my large yes with Ben, <laughs> David Crow. Uh, thanks, Laura. David Crowe from the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne. Thanks for your speech, Minister. Uh, you had some uh, quite alarming figures there on the number of cyber attacks that we're mm. seeing. Can you put it in a budget uh, perspective? Because over the last couple of years, there's been more money allocated to um, cyber defence of Australia in federal budgets. There was yeah. 9.9 .9 billion uh, in this year's budget. There were projects such as Red Spice. I can't remember what the acronym stood for, but mm -hmm. it was funded. Now. Are you, are you banking that money and repurposing it all and putting it to other uh, functions? Um, is any money being returned to consolidated revenue or are you keeping all the funding that's been given there to your department over mm -hmm. time? And given the scale of the challenge that you've outlined, 
are we going to need to spend more money on this yeah, over time? Thank you. Thank you, David. Really good question. So um, I'm not uh, in the habit of, of lavishly praising the former government, but one really important thing they did was make this Red Spice investment, which is run through the Australian Signals Directorate. Um, it's a very important thing for the security of our country and our government is 100% committed to it. Um, there, we are not spending enough on cyber defence at the moment. And so one of my challenges is how are we are going to address that problem? One of the elements of this that is going to be expensive is securing government infrastructure. Uh, we've talked a lot and thought a lot in the public sphere in recent months about cyber security in the private sector. Well, we've got to come at that discussion with a bit of humility because government's got its problems too. And so part of the cyber strategy, one of the four goals, is to establish how we are going to lift and fund the security of Australian government infrastructure. And it is going to require more money. Thanks. Anna Henderson. Uh, Anna Henderson, SBS and NITV. Uh, Minister, I wanted to get your reaction to the release of the Bali bomber Umar Patek today. The families have expressed great disappointment. The Prime Minister has formally described him as abhorrent. Should he still be behind bars? And you've just been in Indonesia. What efforts did you make to change this outcome? Yeah, thank you, Anna. So um, I think it's um, uh, an absolutely horrible day for the victims and families of the Bali bombings. We lost 88 Australians in the Bali bombings. Those people are never coming back and my thoughts today are very much with the families and communities who have lost a loved one. Um, this is a person who was in the Indonesian justice system. My personal view is his actions are inexcusable and completely abhorrent. We don't control the Indonesian justice system and that that is the way of the world. But can I just say, I think all Australians should be thinking today of those families and communities. It was a complete tragedy what happened in Bali, one of our worst terrorist incidents in Australian history and the extent to which this targeted Australians. And they you know, have the deepest sympathies of me personally and the Australian government today. And if I may, did you lobby personally while you were in Indonesia? Um, Anna, I'm not going to explain the discussions I had, but I can just tell you that the Australian government has put in the strongest possible terms our views about what has occurred, and we have, we have done that really clearly. Thank you. Yep, yeah, thank you. Jade Galberger. Jade Galberger from the Herald Sun. Um, in August, you raised concerns that um, people being radicalised in Australia were getting younger and younger. Mm. Have there been any more cases of children this year being radicalised in the playground? And what is your message to parents who may be concerned about their own children being radicalised? Yeah, thank you, Jade. That's a really important question. Um, I haven't talked a lot about um, terrorism today, um, not because it's not crucially important to me and sits very much at the top of my agenda. Um, I've had an opportunity in other forums to speak a bit about the trends that you're referring to there. If I can say briefly, um, one of the elements that's, um, that's changed for our security environment is what terrorism looks like. And if you go back to 2014, 15, 16, we did see a presentation of terrorism that looked very different. It was highly organised um, terrorist attacks that were kind of months in the planning, very well resourced, aimed to cause maximum loss of life and destruction. And what we see now is a number of things have changed. We see much more lone wolf actors. We see a diversity of ideologies away from religious fundamentalism and into other kinds of motivations for violence. And um, we see lower sophistication attacks. And the final thing to mention there is that we see a lot more young people in the caseload. And that is, of course, enormously concerning to me as a minister and something I'm working very hard with my agencies to look at. So um, over the last year, somewhere around half of ASIO's most, um, people of most concern have been under the age of 18. A big change in the shape of this problem. So we are having to look at the model of CT that we adopt because we do need to think differently about this cohort of people. Um, we need to think a lot more about what may be driving them and motivating to violence and then how do we get them off that path and onto something that will allow them to lead a constructive life. It is meaning that we have to uh, work equally as importantly with police but also with healthcare professionals and state governments who are responsible for child welfare. Um, and so I won't 
speak to the specifics of numbers, I'll let the um, Director General of ASIO do that, which he will do when it's um, appropriate for Australians to understand how that problem is shifting and changing, but hopefully that gives you a bit of information. And to the parents? Yep. Yep. So, um, <laughs> so to the parents, um, you know, one of the features that I think is important here is long periods of time that young people are online and unsupervised. And one of the theories about why we're seeing this problem is because we've just been through, you know, two years where lots of Australia's young people have been removed from families and communities and sporting groups that might normally kind of normalise their behaviour and thinking, and they've spent extensive amounts of time alone and online. And I just really, you know, I think all parents are worried about this, and, and I guess I just urge people to just think about if you've got a child that's spending inordinate amounts of time online, make sure you're talking to them about what they're seeing and there's help for you there if there are any issues. Thanks, Andrew, Andrew Green. Minister Andrew Green from the ABC. To Indonesia again, mm -hmm. uh, with the passing of the recent marital law, mm. which has been dubbed a Bali bonk ban, what is your <laughs> meaning, your warnings to Australians uh, when that legislation comes into effect. Are you concerned about the consequences for, for Australian tourists? And is this a trend that you fear uh, similar laws occurring across Southeast Asia? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's a good question. I won't repeat your slightly uh, humorous remark there. It's not appropriate, very much not appropriate. Um, what I would just say is that, you know, this is not, this is not fresh in all countries around the world, the laws look different and Australians need to follow the laws of those countries when they are in them. Um, I will leave the Foreign Minister to, to run the advocacy around um, the impacts of Australian travellers on this problem in Indonesia. Josh Butler. Hi, Minister. Uh, thanks for your speech. Josh Butler from The Guardian. Um, uh, to follow Jade's question, but to go to a specific, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about right-wing extremism. Mm -hmm. I know you talk about the umbrella term yep. of ideological based extremism now, but your predecessor um, in Labor, Christina Keneally, talked a lot about right-wing extremism mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. um, security agencies in this room as well. Mm -hmm. um, where does this issue rank in terms of, th terms of threats that you have to address in your portfolio? And could I ask, what work is being done in that area sort of generally, but if mm -hmm. I could ask specifically about uh, hate speech and radicalisation mm, yeah. online. Yeah, okay, thanks Josh. Um, thank you, uh, Josh, really, really, really important question. So one of, the, one of the trends I just referred to earlier is this sort of um, proliferation of ideologies that are driving people to violence. We see um, big groups of people who are still on a religious fundamentalism pathway, but now a, a very large group of people who are of interest, who are subscribed to various forms of um, right-wing kind of nationalism, Nazism, those sorts of things. And it's obviously enormously concerning. Um, we had the Christchurch bombing, which was, you know, an Australian committing a heinous act of terror in Christchurch in New Zealand. And so this is a problem that I do take very seriously. Um, we are actually looking at um, the way we think about and manage terrorism in Australia to consider whether it is appropriate for these new forms of terrorism that we are seeing. There are some, you know, there was a lot of legislation passed in the second half of uh, the last decade, which was very targeted at a specific type of terrorism. And some of the um, elements or features of the criminal law require um, features that aren't present in the way that right-wing groups organise themselves. So Mark Dreyfus and I are working together to look at some of those laws and see whether there are legal changes that will be needed to capture um, violent conduct in the right-wing terror world that perhaps isn't being caught by what's going on in um, religious fundamentalism. Do you imagine that will be some legislation you introduce next year or is that sort of still being <laughs> through? I think that was a leading question. Um, so I'm not, not ready to get into specifics yet, Josh, but it's certainly something that we're very concerned about. And, you know, you see this with the, uh, the prescribed organisations. Um, most of those prescribed organisations remain um, religiously fundamentalist organisations, yet the shape of our terror threat has evolved. And I think we do need to ask why that listing of prescribed organisations isn't reflecting the shape of the problem. Thank you. Rob Scott, and if I could just appeal to the rest of the people asking questions to ask one question because otherwise your colleagues are going to miss out. Uh, Rob Scott from 7 News, thank you Minister for your um, address. I wanted to ask you about the uh, Medibank hack. In, mm -hmm. in, it, in the group's last upload to the dark web it said this, this was it, it was the final tranche of mm -hmm. stolen information. 
have you been able to work out whether that is in fact all of the information or as Medibank told you that's all the information that was stolen it's out there now or can we expect more to come trickling out and on that same issue sorry Laura, uh, <laughs> on that on that same <laughs> issue it's all connected uh, on that on that same issue um, has <laughs> Has any of that information been used by those criminals or other people on the dark web to, to steal um, identities or extract money from the victims? Yeah, OK, thank you, Rob. Um, so uh, I think the, the best evidence that we have at the moment is that the hackers have dumped the remaining data and walked away, seeing that they're not going to get payment out of the attempted um, situation that they tried to create. Um, but one of the most disturbing aspects of these incidents is that once stolen, the data is gone. And this is the same with Optus. We've kind of moved on mentally from Optus as a country. The data is still gone. And one of the reasons that we need to work so hard nationally to lift protections around sensitive data is just the extremely severe consequences of what happens when it does, uh, does get stolen. Can I say something about um, how the data has been used or not been used? As Cybersecurity Minister, I felt um, so proud of how Australia handled that situation. There, were, um, there was data circulating about Australians that was extremely sensitive and hurtful. I did not see any of it printed in newspapers. I didn't see it circulating on social media. And I didn't see anyone seriously argue that Medibank should have paid the ransom and then we could have all gone off and into our fairyland thinking that that would solve the problem. And from my perspective, we stood up to a bully and we won. Tr Any... No, sorry. <laughs> Trudy McIntosh. <laughs> <laughs> Three questions is a bridge too far, Laura. Thanks, Minister. Trudy McIntosh from Sky News. What lessons have you learned from the repatriation of former ISIS brides and their families back to Western Sydney? And if and when there is to be a second cohort um, brought home, do you promise to consult with communities first this time? Thank you, Trudy. Um, I think it was a really important thing for the Australian government to bring back the four women and 13 children, the oldest of whom is a 13-year-old girl, who've been repatriated so far to Syria. Um, when I'm asked about this, I'm at pains to explain why the Australian government has done that. And I really want people to understand that the people at the heart of this matter are Australian citizens and they are therefore entitled to request a passport and return to our country when they are able to do so. So the question for us is, is the safest thing for these 13 children to grow up in a squalid camp where they are subjected to radical ideologies every single day and then return to Australia at some point when they're an adult? Or is it safer for us to bring them here so they can live a life around Australian values? And in, with regard to these specific people, the Australian government made a later decision. Um, in terms of lessons, I mean, we followed very closely when the former government did exactly the same thing with a number of children and one adult that they repatriated from Syria. Um, the um, operation was very successful from my point of view. Um, I went to Western Sydney and talked to community leaders. I fiercely believe, and I think every politician would agree, that when we do something that affects local communities, they are entitled to have us go to them and talk to them, and that is what I did. Um, and with regard to future repatriations, we have not made any further decisions about that. Ben Westcott. Sorry about that, but for Mays back there. Uh, ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Um, <clears throat> thanks for your speech. There was a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, there seems to be some conflicting messages about Australia's cyber security capabilities to the international uh, listeners. So on one hand, obviously, Australia has sent cyber experts to Ukraine to help out in the war there, uh, and you yourself have announced uh, Australia will be leading a ransomware initiative. On the other hand, you just described sort of the past 10 years as a cyber slumber, and um, which is a great phrase, and uh, sort of uh, you've ordered this new cyber security strategy. Um, how do we balance those two conflicting views of Australia's cyber readiness? And do you think that Australia is in a position yet to lead the world on cyber security? Yeah, what a great question. Thank you. So I would say two things about that. Um, we have the best cyber minds in the world in Australia, and we have um, a lot of patchiness around cyber security in Australia. And those two things can exist at once. And the goal of the cyber strategy is to bring the nation into this fight so we can lift the country up together. And that is where the effort is required. In terms of world leading skills and expertise, you know, the Australian Signals Directorate is a truly amazing organisation that 
countries around the world fight to partner with Australia because of the skills and capabilities we have in that organisation. The Australian Federal Police also has enormous skills and capabilities. Um, if you look at the work that was done, um, led by the Secretary of Mine Department, Mike Pizzullo, who's just behind you there, on the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act in the last parliament. When I describe that law to people, to politicians around the world, their mouths are open, thinking, how can we construct something similar in, in our country? So I think you're just seeing something where there's patches of absolute world-leading brilliance, but I think a long tail of areas where we really need to lift our game. So that's what the cyber strategy is about. Thank you. Sarah Basford Canales. Thanks, Minister. Sarah Basford Canales from the Canberra Times. Um, Wall Street Journal is reporting that Apple is looking to strengthen even further its data encryption protections. It's something that um, agencies in your own department have sort of described as being detrimental to public safety and a barrier to investigations. It's also tech experts also warn that putting in these backdoors for those investigations can also lead to giving a backdoor to hackers. Mm -hmm. How do you strike the right balance for data privacy in the age that we're in following the, um, the breaches at Optus and, and Medibank as well? Yeah, <laughs> that might need to be the subject of a future speech, I think. <laughs> You've asked me something really difficult and complex there. Um, look, we do have to strike a balance and I don't think it's possible to lay out what those decisions look like to cover the whole scope of decision making that we will need to do. I would just say with regard to encryption and the laws that were passed by the former government, there was a lot of um, discussion at the time that this would destroy the technology industry in Australia and that we would never recover from those changes and the laws passed and I just haven't seen any evidence that that was real. So just note that for, for future discussions about these subjects. Um, look, we have to have an open and free society where people are entitled to privacy and be able to fight crime at the same time, and that's the balance that we need to strike. I'll just finish by saying that um, the kind of so-called backdoor hasn't been a feature of any cyber attack that I'm aware of. There may be ones that, that, um, that are not, but it certainly wasn't an issue with Optus and Medibank. Um, one of the features of cyber security that any cyber expert in this room, and there's many, many of them, uh, will tell you is that most cyber attacks actually aren't very sophisticated. And this is one of the issues we need to, to grapple with. Most people can protect themselves better. Most companies can protect themselves better. And it's about, I think, nailing the basics in many instances um, when we spend a lot of time worrying about and talking about the kind of nth degree of complexity, which isn't usually a feature of these attacks. And it's a code. Hi, Minister. Thanks for your speech. Melissa Code from The Mandarin. My question is also about sovereign capability with mm -hmm. respect to cybersecurity. Uh, the great transformation and reset you describe, which touches on both institutional change and policy change, echoes a sentiment that we need better um, cybersecurity capability in Australia. Mm -hmm. What is your position on the professionalisation of cybersecurity and the impacts that might have on diversity mm -hmm. and women? Fantastic, great. Um, so I think, um, I mean, these are questions that the cyber strategy team will explore. And one of the most important things that I want to end up with at the end of the strategy work is a clear pathway to Australia being a fantastic place to open a cyber security business. There are um, lots of things, assets that we bring to this conversation that are common around the world. We've got great cyber skills, we've got good tech skills in our country, we need a lot more of them. Um, what we have here that is quite rare is a very functional regulatory environment. And I know that's a bit controversial, but our parliament works <laughs> quite well. Um, and we can legislate in ways that are very hard for other countries around the world. And I think that is actually part of the solution here around sovereign capabilities. Um, you make a really important point of, around diversity um, and it's, it's very interesting. I spend a lot of time um, with the Australian Signals Director at an Australian Cyber Security Centre. Um, you know, their organisations and indeed their equivalents around the world are really pushing on this because we know if we only have cyber experts that look a particular way, we're missing huge skills and capabilities across the rest of the population. So we'll work with the, the cyber security strategy to try to drive more diversity in the sector and it's going to be a critical part of us meeting our goals. Brendan Howe. 
Uh, thanks, Minister, for your speech. Brandon Howe from innovationoz.com. Mm -hmm. um, ahead of announcing the cybersecurity strategy today, uh, Home Affairs consulted on a national data security action plan uh, which sought um, consideration on an explicit approach to data localization, noting that um, a lot of free trade agreements Australia has signed include a, a commitment against uh, introducing data localization laws. Uh, I was just wondering. Um, what role do you see data localization playing in enhancing data security mm -hmm. and in your work so far? Um, has uh, What's the reaction been from big tech companies? Thank you. Um, it is really important. Um, data, lo data localization is um, going to very much be a feature of the um, discussion that the cyber strategy has and indeed that the work of the National Resilience Task Force does. Um, we have existed for a long time in the benign belief that wherever data is located, it can be equally held safe. And I think anyone who kind of pays vague attention to these matters knows today that that is absolutely untrue. So it's part of the work of my department um, in terms of you know, specific feedback. With these discussions with tech companies, you always get a whole variety of feedback. I think some people recognise this as crucially important. Others see it principally as a cost to their business and we just have to navigate those different views. Ashley Week. Hi, Minister. Ashley Week from Nine News here. Thank you for your speech. Just back to the Bali bomber, Umar Patek, the Indonesian government says he has been rehabilitated. Mm. How confident is the Australian government that he's not a threat to Australia or Australians travelling in Indonesia? Yeah. Thank you. So I, I have read that that is the view of the Indonesian government. I don't have any independent information that verifies that and I don't think either it is appropriate for me to comment on outcomes in the Indonesian justice system. I would just say again that this is a horrible day for families of Bali bomb victims. We've got 88 people that were tragically and violently killed um, for no reason other than that they were Australian. So I think everyone around our country is feeling really aggrieved by this and that's my answer. Yeah. Thank you. Our final question today is from the University's Australia Higher Education Journalist of the Year, John Ross. <laughs> thanks, Laura, and um, thanks, Minister. Um, you mentioned the backlog of a thousand, mm. oh, sorry, a million mm. unprocessed um, visa applications. Mm. So hundreds of them came from a group of people, people who'd been accepted to do PhDs in this country from three specific countries, China, Pakistan, Iran. Mm -hmm. Some of these people have been waiting for three years mm -hmm. now. The, yeah. the government changed six months ago. They're still waiting. My sense is Australia's not inclined to trust research um, students from certain countries, but it doesn't want to say so. Mm -hmm. So it fobs them off um, with uh, pro forma emails and things like that. Um, these people are tearing their hairs out. They've paid $650 a pop, at least, um, asking Australia to consider them to, uh, coming here and getting a visa. Uh, quite apart from the damage this is doing to our, our research sector, it seems like a straight out consumer affairs um, issue to me. Is this a reasonable way for a civilised country to treat people? <laughs> Well, John, thank you for your question and my congratulations, my warm congratulations on your award today. Um, so um, I don't agree with your characterisation of what's happened here. Um, we have got, as I said, a million unprocessed visas sitting in the system. Some of those are more complicated than others and I'm you know, happy to hear a bit more about the applications that you're referring to. Can I say as a general um, statement that having young people studying PhDs in our country on areas of you know, significance to our nation is crucially important. And we are not going to continue to see that if we are forcing people to wait for years at a time. We've got Professor Brian Schmidt from um, the Australian National University here who came to our country as a young person and um, I, I can't remember the details, I think his visa was processed, it was within three weeks, three weeks, three days, four days. Four days. <laughs> His visa was processed in four days. Now, this is one of the smartest people in Australia. And if we had made him wait for three years, well, of course he would never have come here. And we would have lost that intellect and drive and the Nobel Prize that came with it. Thank you, Brian Schmidt, um, to another country. So I just say, we've got to get the system working 
for the country and we are really trying to do that at the moment but I can tell you it is turning the Titanic. This has been dormant for a long time and I cannot see the mildest shred of evidence of any interest of the two former Home Affairs Ministers in the kind of questions that you're asking me here. This is a driver of our productivity, our wealth, our prosperity, our future as a country and yet it was essentially left to its own devices for too long and we are trying to change that. Thank you. Please thank Claire O'Neill. Thank you. Where do I go now, Laura? We'd better shake hands, have we? Shake hands and don't give us. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Membership of the, uh, okay. the press club, so you can come back and see us again. <laughs> this is my membership of the National Press Club. Thank you very much. <laughs> A generous gift. Thank you. <laughs>